welcome to the Oneida County History Center. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Rebecca McLean, Executive Director here at the History Center, and I'd like to welcome you all to our exhibit opening and talk of Utica Shoes, Who Knew? I'm going to introduce Patrick Reynolds. He is our Director of Public Programs here at the History Center. Um, I could give you a long bio. He used to work at the Ford Museum, Rome Historical, um, many more places. He's been with us for about a year and a half. We are very lucky to have him, so I hope you enjoy his presentation. You haven't heard me talk, but you're applauding anyway. So. <clears throat> Some of us saw the exhibit, which is great. Thank you, thank you. So if I can remember, there we go. Is that good? Yes. Utica Shoes. So all good stories start with a, their own story. Um, contrary to popular opinion, we don't sort of wander around in storage looking at artifacts on a, any regular basis, unfortunately, because we're pretty busy. But um, one day, Alicia, who's right here, is one of our volunteers, God, something got to her and she wanted to know like what was in these boxes up on this top shelf. And we pulled out and there was some shoe stuff and I went into the historical information file, which we have volumes of information about this place. And there's a manila folder with one piece of paper in it with a short description of Utica shoe making. Let's just continue on and see how we can get through. Bring it down to Utica. Unfortunately, uh, on a bright day, the projector doesn't do as good as some, but this is Utica in 1802. Beautiful view in 1807. 1815, the, the city's starting to grow. 1815, they're just getting ready to plan for the Erie Canal, right, which went right through town here. And they were making shoes. You know, any town, everybody needs shoes. That's what I said in the exhibit, is everybody needs shoes. And um, each town usually had a cobbler or a shoemaker. Cobblers actually fix shoes, but shoemakers actually make them. These are actually wooden lasts. They are the pattern that a shoe is built on top of. So it's like a mold. There's different sizes for everybody's different shoes. And um, they worked on frequently a little cobbler's bench, which we've got a little miniature one right in the case right there. It's like it's child size, so I don't really know what's going on. If it, there were kids that made shoes, but they often worked right on their laps. Um, and the shoemakers in Utica, you know, um, there were some that were itinerant shoemakers and they would come and stay at your family's house and make shoes for everybody and you'd feed them instead. Um, and soon they used to sort of pair up. So you'd get an apprentice or a couple people making shoes because scaling up is always a good thing. But why here? Why are they making shoes in Utica? Canals, cows, hemlock trees. You with me? You know about the canal, Albany to Buffalo, so that's the, where we can ship raw materials and finished goods. What year did it open? Come on, 1825, yeah. A little, parts of it opened before that, but. Here's Utica in 1825, and you can see it, uh, the canal ran about where Route 5 is. Not Route 5, Whitesboro Street. I'm not from Utica, so I get I lost sometimes. Um, and the other thing we had in this area is cows. Why do we have cows? Dairy. Dairy, right. We make cheese. We made cheese from the 1830s, got bigger in the 1860s and 70s. New York was, and Oneida County even, was one of the leading areas for making cheese. So when you're done with the cow, you've got the skin, right? <laughs> and you'd have to make it into leather. This is a detail, I don't know if you can see it, this is a detail of an 1839 map of Utica. And there used to be an alley called Morocco Alley. And Morocco is a reference to a type of leather. It's not all from Morocco, but it's treated, it's the very fine leather um, similar to kid, which is goat. It's the, it's the thinner one, it's the back of the cows. So there was some um, leather working going on in that part of town, which is basically where the odd is today, I think is where this alley was. 
But the other thing we have in this area is hemlock trees. Because to tan leather, you need an acid, and hemlock is the big one to use for uh, tanning leather. And you can see our star, and the green is the growth where hemlock grows in New York. We're right in between two major regions, the Adirondacks and the Catskills. And they were making leather on large scale in upstate New York. Here they are peeling the bark off the trees and then scraping the hides, which is a crazy thing to think about. And then they would soak them in vats. I don't know if it's hot water or, or you leave them there for a period of time and it converts the animal proteins into something that's gonna last, which is what we know as leather. This is a slide up in the Adirondacks of um, a sleigh full of hemlock bark. So you need large amounts. This is before they use, today they use chemicals a lot, alkaline and lyes and things like that, but they used to do it all naturally with hemlock. And this is a shot of, um, in Jordan Falls, New York. And in the upper left, see those structures that look like houses? They're actually piles of hemlock bark. You'd move it often in the winter because it's easier, there's no muddy trails to mess with and things like that, so they would move it and stack it. Um, it's a little bit of a diversion from Utica Shoes, but it's, it's, it's why we're here, is because we're surrounded by um, some major leather producing regions. Here's a more modern photograph of the vats soaking leather. And then they would be graded and sorted and things like that. There's different types of the, different parts of the cow are better for the, the sole of your shoes versus the back and gloves are a different part. So in 1830s, you know, the, the shoemaker, um, they weren't really congregated in one area, but they were on Lower Genesee Street for the most part and a little, some in the area of John Street and Baggs Hotel. That they, the shoemakers wanted to be downtown because there was kind of foot traffic, if you would. Um, so this is the west side of Baggs Square, which you don't always see this building in the North American Hotel. And interestingly, while I was sort of doing this research, I found this folk art painting of a great fire in Utica in 1837, which is a real thing. This is a fire screen that's in a private collection. But it depicts the great fire of 1837, which took out the whole block on this side, including the American Hotel, which is seen in the background here, took out that whole block. And it took a lot of the shoemakers' uh, shops away at, at the time. So now we're moving ahead in time. This is Utica about 1855. The railroads are, are going and the factories uh, start going. And the shoemaking people took, took the lead from the textile people, which we have an exhibit about the cotton industry over here with some beautiful lithographs that I encourage you to take a look at. But um, Utica very deliberately took on steam engines in the mass production of textiles. That's what the big factories, you know, all these buildings are. So they applied that to making shoes, and although the buildings weren't as big, because making shoes is kind of small scale, um, and nonetheless, they did apply steam engines, and they put a lot of people to work. And what they did is break it down into individual uh, tasks. So somebody's cutting the leather, somebody else is doing the soles, somebody else is doing you know, other parts. Uh, at first there were just small factories of maybe 15 or 20 people, still a lot of handwork going on. Uh, 1862, this is Mr. Cloys. This is one that almost fell off the radar because um, this was a factory located on Meadow Street. Anybody know where that is? No, because it's not really there anymore. North, north of the railroad track on the east side of Genesee Street, no, excuse me, the west side of Genesee Street, where the, the big gas tanks used to be, if any of you remember them, that is um, Meadow Street. One, two, three, four, well, he's got a five-story building, starting in 1862. Um, this was a funny little story about copper-toed shoes, right? Because I read an ad for one of the Utica shoemakers was proudly selling these copper-toed shoes, which I had never heard of what is a copper-toed shoe. 
And actually, it was an invention by a frugal father, and the, his kids were kicking the toes out of their shoes and destroying them. So he cut a little piece of copper out of a washboard, and he nailed it into the front of the toes so that they couldn't kick, kick and break them. Um, and it was really a resourceful thing to make the shoes last. And it turns out that the school kids were really enamored and proud of these little sparkly toes on their shoes, even though it was a sign that they were, essentially they were poor and they were trying to get by without new shoes. Um, but it actually got, he patented the idea of copper toed shoes and multiple factories made them. They made them here in Utica. These aren't actually, we don't have any in our collection, but I thought it was just a fun little side story of copper toed shoes. There's actually a children's book with, the, with that name. So this is uh, the Reynolds brothers, no relation to me. This is my last name, but I'm not related to uh, the Reynolds. They got their first big factory, one, two, we got four stories going in 1865. Uh, interestingly, Mr. Reynolds also collected show chickens <laughs> and competed in county fairs and state fairs. I think he had a, a chicken in Chicago. Don't know a lot more. There's, Plenty more research to do on a whole bunch of this stuff. Um, but he got his factory going, and um, once the leather comes in the factory, you would grade it, and this is a little diagram that tells you the different parts. Gives good, honest service. Swells well in water, things like that. This is a shot of inside the shoe factory where they're actually cutting out the patterns for the shoes. And talking about mechanization, sewing machines are a big part of it. So this, this kind of looks like a standard sewing machine, but they are used, rather than sewing by hand, you use a sewing machine to, to, to sew the welds and stuff like that. But the big one is the McKay sewing machine, which does the, the hard sewing, which is the soles. And this was a tremendous in innovation, probably took 10 people, could do the work of 10 people essentially. And it's documented that these were um, widely adopted in the shoe factories in um, Utica. And there's a gentleman on the right operating one of them, probably a little more modern version of the machine. At first they were hand cranked, but eventually you had a steam engine and belts. And here's a little diagram of the, the process of putting on. There's over 600 steps used to make a pair of shoes. So I can appreciate the difficulty and the expense of, of, some, of some of these handmade shoes. Uh, the Reynolds expanded their factory. Um, let me just back up. This one, so keep an eye on this. This is their first small building, and then we'll go ahead. It's the one on the upper right. He also soon after built a larger factory across the street. The Reynolds Building, which was there until the 70s. One, two, three, had a steam elevator, had electric lights. And the first floor was a showroom, because it was right around the corner from the train station, which is a lot of traffic. So it's a great place to, to have it. Um, raw materials went up on the top floor, and finished shoes came out the bottom. There are no interior um, shots of the factories in Utica, or at least so far I haven't found any, but these are some other ones. Uh, some are, there's well, was a big one in Syracuse, Endicott Johnson, which is down in the valley. Uh, I just included them to give you an idea of what it, what, they see, what it would have looked like. You can see the overhead shafts for some of it, um, and everybody's got their own individual workstations. They divided the labor, as I said. Some people were polishing, some people were putting the laces on or the buttons. Uh, included in the exhibit is a great collection of trade cards. Um, these are two from the Reynolds brothers. They're like baseball cards, and there's some here and there's some over there. We actually have probably a collection of maybe 200, I think. Um, Mrs. Proctor collected a lot of them. But they were beautiful, and they're stamped on the back with their name. Um, and it was a way to keep your name in front of people. And they're, some of them were cute. They, they don't always sew shoes. Sometimes they show just little animals, just something cute that you could take at home and remember 
the shoemakers. There's the back of it. Um, Reynolds Brothers celebrated fine shoes, latest styles, best materials, superior finish, and perfect fitting. Uh, on sale in principal cities and towns across the United States. So yeah, they put their shoes either in a packet boat or on a train and would send them to New York City. They were going to New England. They were going to any city that really needed them. Uh, exclusively in Utica, and I don't really know why, was ladies, misses, and children's. They did not make men's shoes here. They did not make work boots here. Fine shoes were not even work boots. I mean, these were nicer shoes that you would wear out for the evening or to a wedding, which there's some wedding shoes on exhibit. And this is an example of, of what the styles were at the time buttoned up sides, and there's a couple on exhibit. We don't have a huge collection here at the History Center just because they don't exist, but um, this gives you an idea of, of what they looked like. So here's an ad from the Reynolds Brothers. Way back in the 60s, we were making fine shoes. Now that we're in the 90s, the product is 90 times better. So they've been around for a long time. They've evolved over 30 years making fine shoes welts, turns. They also um, were starting to use Goodyear. Uh, Goodyear is, refers to rubber. And they figured out how to vulcanize rubber in this time period, and it actually made it from being a hard kind of plastic to actually be even flexible. So they used it for the soles of the shoes, which makes it waterproof. There's another big factory, the Holbrook, 1872. This was up on Catherine Street. One, two, three, four, five stories tall. Got going good. Ladies' shoes again. It was actually Holbrook and Ludlow at first, and then Ludlow kind of moved away from it. Within about a year of building their factory, there was a tremendous fire on Genesee Street in 1888. And this is the scene. We have about two pictures from this fire, and it took out more than a whole block, including their factory. Looks like a war zone, doesn't it? Dresden. But they rebuilt. Um, the factories did employ men, women, children, all ages. Here's some women, a little detail of, of, of women's working in the shoe factory in Syracuse. I found this, uh, this was just an odd ad. That they were going to catch your eye, right, in the newspaper. First, you look down, he says, if you want to see a man killed at Cody's, what is it? But if you really read it, it's, it's an ad for shoes, fine assortment of boots and things like that. They were playing with the typography in the old newspapers then, then because they didn't have like the internet, they didn't have television, anything like that. So. Exclusively women's and children's shoes. This is a, from an ad from Holbrook's. So here, these are the three big factories. There were other smaller ones. Reynolds Brother had the largest factory, 600 workers, right? Made 1,000 pairs of shoes a day. That's just one of the factories there. Total sales of the factory in Utica, $2 million a year, which equates to $63 million in today's money. That is a substantial substantial. So what happened? They're doing great guns. So this is eight, they started after the Civil War, 1870s, 1880s, they're doing great. <clears throat> but an ongoing struggle with the labor. They wanted higher wages and better working conditions, which is usually, usually what, what the, the labor, labor people, people want, want, right? <clears throat> And because they divided up the labor into steps, if you would, if one department chose to go on strike, they'd shut the whole factory down. And there was a growing um, movement towards actual unionization. They were called the Knights of Pythias. And it started with the Irish Catholics over in Boston. The shoemaker, Irish Catholic shoemakers formed like one of the first unions. And the ideas sort of spread 
Um, but here they are striking in the 1870s. Um, they're earning $18 a week, making what, 30 pairs a day, and they're comparing it to the other wages. Cutters are making a certain part. You know, different departments made different amount of money, so that sometimes they'd go on strike just as they were trying to get even with their, their friends and things like that. But eventually, um, Mr. Reynolds and Mr. Holbrook, they got sick of it, and they shut their factories down. 1893, they're all gone. Mr. Reynolds moved to Chicago, where he got involved with urban planning and architecture. Um, the other gentleman basically was financially uh, stricken and didn't do too well for himself after that, Mr. Holbrook. Holbrook, when it closed, this was a sale. He sold all the inventory. So there was 5,000 pairs of shoes being sold and this was over at a store over in Buffalo where they just must have shipped a whole bunch out of them. Um, Price-wise, these shoes, there's actually prices inside, written inside some of the shoes for three and four dollars, four fifty. If you do the math, that's like an eighty dollar shoe, which is, you know, it's kind of a standard decent shoe today. So they were all gone by 1893. But as you may know, there was a little bit more going in Utica shoes. Herds. So Herds, um, the original company started in 1872. And uh, he was actually a shoe salesman for one of the other companies. And it's important to know that in, for most of its life, um, oh, this is DeWitt Herd. And I, I believe these are his wedding shoes, which are on an exhibit right over there. Um, it's important to remember, Herd did not manufacture shoes, but they were a wholesale distributor. So they bought other shoes, either made to their specifications or, you know, moving Buster Brown shoes or Converse shoes like that. Um, they were sold under the Herd brand to private shops and later national chains like JCPenney, Target, and Sears. I learned Target existed back into the 1920s and 30s. I thought it was a new, a new thing. Uh, the, this is one building that still stands because all the other ones are gone. This is the Herd and Fitzgerald building, which is down by the train station. It was built in 1911, designed by a Utica architect named Frederick Gouge who did quite a few buildings down in that area. The, uh, the Children's Museum is another one of his buildings and, and probably more. And they had quite a good brand with uh, salesmen going to different towns in New York, New England. I'm, I'm not even sure how far afield they got, um, but they were around for a long time. Um, we have Two catalogs of their shoes uh, on exhibit. One is from the 20s, and we have one from the 1970s that we just purchased um, just to show the, the, the lifespan of it. And there are some beautiful shoes, I must say. Oxfords. Uh, they did have a contract with um, Goodyear, and they were selling this newfangled thing, tennis shoes, as they call them which are, those are the old high tops. It was before they, little did they know what they would turn into as far as a, a uh, fad and things that it is today. Rubber footwear, that's from Goodyear, you know, overshoes and, and rubber work boots. And their business model was really predicated for the most part selling to mom and pop shoe stores. This is, I believe, Genesee Street. Then there's probably two or three shoe stores in this lineup. So a, a salesman would go to them, take their order, and the orders would get rolled up and shipped to them. Yeah, 30s or 40s, you thinking? From those cars? I think they're 40s. If I were to guess, this is a Rhodes photo. If anybody knows Utica, if that helps date it. And here's a little... Carrots shoe store featuring uh, Buster Brown and Keds, probably bought from the herd retailer down the street. 
and they did quite well. Here's the catalog that's in the exhibit. Here's 1977 celebrating their 106th year. And there's, not to embarrass you, there's some herds in the family. How many generations worked? Five generations ran, ran this business. My favorite in this catalog, in the lower right, there's a little frog slipper. <laughs> so that's 77. Well, there was something else that was going on nationally that affected them. Oh, before I get to that, uh, interestingly, in the 1970s, I don't have the year right on here, her company bought an IBM 360 mainframe computer, which was an astounding amount of money. I think you had to rent them, because it was like a million dollar computer. Um, and they were gonna use it for inventorying and tracking orders and, and mailing stuff and things like that. Turns out they had enough co leftover computing power that they sort of, at least for a short while, had a, a company called Efficiency Through, Efficiency Through Computers. And for $75 a month, you could have this computer do your work for you. Uh, inventory, payroll, things like that, analysis and things like that. Not a lot of details. I only found one ad when I went to look for it. But um, it's kind of amazing to think the, that powerful computer being used in Utica at a fairly early time. But unfortunately, things were changing in the retail sales department. Riverside Mall, 1974. Mom and pop stores start to go away, right? Look how nice inside, all plastic and clean and no snow and things like that. So unfortunately for the herd company, at least in part, um, the malls made the mom and pop stores go away, but there was also competition from cheap foreign made shoes and eventually they closed up in 1993. But that doesn't mean they're gone because they live on in, in museums. This is the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And in their collection are several herd shoes. I don't know that they claim that they're made by herd or sold by herd, but um, those are in, the graphics in the case are also heard. And they have more than this. There's probably 10 or 12 in their permanent collection, which is nice to think. But it lives on in other ways, too. We featured um, this summer a walking tour of the Sioux District. It was part of the farmer's market. And we walked around and looked where the buildings were. And we stopped to buy some of the spots. This is still available. You can do it on your smartphone and things like that, available through our website. And we were happy on the first tour that some of the Heard family actually joined along and shared stories so that we could learn more of their recent history, which isn't always written down as much. And we got to, of course, pose in front of the building, which still has the sign emblazoned at the top, which I hope they leave it up there. Utica Shoes, <clears throat> who knew? Did you know? That's all I got. Thank you. <clears throat> you got any questions? You got one. Uh, that's not a question. I just want to comment that uh, the, uh, you get a picture up here of uh, the shoes in the 40s, I guess, in the store that was Karaz. And I just saw them at over at the Martin Shopping Center. They still exist. I bet it is. <laughs> I bet it is. <laughs> Other questions or memories or thoughts? There's one in the back. You said that they use the hemlock tree bark. Yes. Do they use it for the salt or for the tap? It's the acid in the acid leaches out of the bark. And actually, if you go up in the Adirondacks, certain parts, the streams are brown from the runoff from the decomposing bark, at least in part. But it, um, I don't know all the chemistry, but it, it, it acts on the skin of the leather to, to preserve it and make it, make it flexible, too. Yeah. What did they do with the hemlock trees? What did they do with the hemlock trees? They stripped the bark, which kills them. Um, hemlock is a pretty much a softwood, 
So it's not really good for heating. I mean, there, there are some accounts that you would walk through the forest and you would just see piles of white dead trees laying on there. They just left them where they fell, which can lead to fire issues down the road and things like that. But it's, you can use it for fencing. You can do barn, exterior barns, but it's a softwood, so it's limited use. Any more questions? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so there was a tariff on American made or, or imported, I want to say imported stuff, which made the American shoes appear to be a better thing to buy. I'm not explaining it right, but it protected American manufacturers by this tariff. And I think you're right, 1893 is when it went away, and that undercut the shoe factory's sort of profitability here. But thank you for reminding me on that. We good? No. We got refreshments. There's cider and donuts and some crackers and cheese. Please feel free to check out the exhibit. And, uh, and thank you for coming. Thank you.